There are multiple threads linking the modern world of economics with theological economia. But perhaps the thickest among these, as well as the most urgent for our contemporary moment, is debt. We remain indebted to our masters just as we are indebted to our gods. As the image of enlightened white politicians circulates omnipresently throughout the global economy, denominating that world as belonging to them, so too does the imprint of the divine imago denote who belongs to the realm of God. Under imperial rule, circulation of the sovereign image serves to territorialize undisciplined regions under a stable heavenly order, consolidating disparate zones into a single unified territory. On earth, as in heaven, it appears that a valorization of unity is necessary to justify and impose divine rule. What then might we say properly distinguishes these two realms? Whereas Caesar's image marks the surface of coins, remaining external to the currency holder, God's image is imprinted internally, deep into the flesh of the human. Perhaps even deeper. As such, each of us are coins circulating in a divine economy that must ultimately return to their source by means of either living sacrifice or death. And here is perhaps where finitude marks something of a difference. It is only within an earthly economy that death makes possible liberation from one's debts. Within a heavenly economy, there is no such reprieve, no release from bondage. We are delivered from captivity to captivity. To be sure, this presents a bleak picture of man as eternal debtor, where an infinitely compounding interest is owed unto the divine. After all, there is no negotiating away one's foundational relation, and no one can serve two masters, except perhaps when those masters are wedded in the glorious figure of a divine Caesar who simultaneously liberates and enslaves by means of divine conquest, economic or otherwise. But suppose the owner of these debt obligations suddenly ceased to exist. Would this not then cancel any obligation that had at one time been impressed upon us? Would we not then bear the image of one who exists no more? With the lifting of this debt, we may discover a peculiar lightness of spirit, a sudden decrease in gravity as we float freely, dislodged from the sovereign realm of the signifier. Are we not now decentralized coins that have lost their image? as well as their ultimate point of return? Given the bewildering trauma of this loss, perhaps we should not be overly surprised at the multiplication of neuroses we witness as the frenetic quest for identity only accelerates. To that point, it may be of some help to understand, as Devin Singh suggests, the ascension as abandonment and void, a means of coping with the traumatic absence of the Savior's body. But this is not the only possible response. For example, we might consider, in a productive sense, what is made possible by the absence of the sovereign body. What remains to be formed are new worlds, connections, affinities, resonances, and conceptions of what bodies, even absent ones, can do. Thank you.
In this episode, Preston Price and I speak with Devin Singh, author of the book Divine Currency, The Theological Power of Money in the West. I have to say, I really enjoyed this conversation, and Devin clearly articulates his positions on debt and the potency of thinking about money within early patristic theology. Check us out on Facebook or Twitter, and uh, let us know what you think. We want to hear from you. All right, here's Devin Singh. So yeah, Preston and I were talking before you um, jumped on that uh, we don't we don't really know that that much about you. You know, you and I met really briefly at AAR in Boston. Right. Actually, now that I know that you are a um, you know kung fu master, if a fight breaks out at AAR, I'm going to stay close to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was, that is a pretty you know violent space. So <laughs> um, certainly a lot of a lot of tensions there that can arise. But yeah. I don't know how I feel about bringing that, bringing that, the martial arts skills into that, that academic space, but you know, hey man, you know, it's all about being experimental. It need be exactly. <laughs> but you gave this like really interesting short talk on Agamben, um, talking about the notion of ascension uh, as abandonment and void, and I, yeah, it was really interesting. And you know, I'm someone who's really interested in in radical theology, so I was there, and mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I gotta, we gotta talk to this guy because you know, the ascension is really under theorized, you know, in, in that, in that, in those circles. And, you know, Tom Altizer just kind of outright dismisses it. Mm-hmm. I've heard mm-hmm. him, I've heard him say, it's just, that's a terrible idea. Why'd they write that? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. I mean, I definitely would be curious to, to, to hear more about what, well, what Altizer says about it. Traditional Christianity believes that after the crucifixion, Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. Now I repudiate the doctrine of the ascension. I believe that the movement of the Incarnation is a continual and total movement into flesh. So that after the crucifixion, Christ does not return to heaven. He does not ascend to heaven. On the contrary, he descends ever more deeply into the flesh, into the world, into life. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be my thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm working on this book on debt, but my next project, so the third book, will be about, about these themes. Um, and it will probably be the most theological thing I've done. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you as you noted, I'm I'm interested in thinking about you know the ascension as a placeholder for dealing with abandonment and dealing with uh, the void and sort of the absence um, of God uh, in the Christian tradition. And in particular, I guess when, when how I got into this was think about the various coping strategies that that theology as well as ecclesial practices and, and the sort of church tradition has used to sort of deal with that abandonment and the trauma that that brings. Um, and so political theology, I think it can be one of those things. So that this sort of desire to sort of manage and control and sort of exert sovereignty over space and territory, I think kind of this turn to Christian empire can be read in part as, as um, uh, you know, a way to sort of try to manifest presence. I mean, God, God is gone in a sense. And so how can we institute divine sovereignty uh, and cope with this, this sense of abandonment? And um, I think, you know, uh, yeah, understanding Christian empire and political theology in those terms can be helpful. <clears throat> so that's part of it. Um, certainly, I think things about just theories of the church, the body of Christ, obviously, is sort of dealing with the, the loss of, the, of the, the body of the Savior. I have a friend and colleague who's working on the ending of Mark um, and sort of the, the, the death of Christ. I mean, it's a, this, this, these ideas that the, the later endings are added on later with, with sort of presenting the resurrected Christ, but really it ends with, with the death and with the, the absent body and the corpse and whatnot and the missing corpse of, of the savior. And so there's a lot of interesting things that I think can be theorized and drawn out of that in terms of its implications for Christian thought and also for kind of Western traditions of thought. Yeah. yeah you've been writing and thinking at, at this intersection of theology and politics and now economy for a while, I guess, where, where does that interest come from for you? I think part of it, um, thinking about my own kind of biography and, and, and background, mm-hmm. You know, I grew up in uh, international development contexts. My mom was a lifelong foreign service officer working for the Department of State. Um, she worked for USAID, the Agency for International Development, which is a prime, primary sort of aid arm of the State Department. Um, and uh, from age three to 10, 
uh, we were in Africa. I was in Cameroon for four years and Morocco for three years. And sort of immersed at an early age in these questions of <clears throat> development, um, neocolonialism, uh, geopolitics. You know, I would sort of accompany her on trips to visit sites. So, you know, whether they're agricultural sites or different economic development sites or um, health and education sites. And so part of that was just sort of, I was immersed in that and I wasn't really aware of <clears throat> how it was impacting me until much later in college as I began to sort of sort through my interests and experiences and began to, you know, I was drawn to uh, liberation theology and that, that was a big formative experience for me and a formative discourse for me. Um, but, but I realized that part of that was trying to make sense of this experience um, and, and the exposure to culture and politics and um, these issues overseas and trying to sort through that. And that, that was, a, you know, an, an initial impulse. I think one of the guiding ones for me, um, I also find, find it conceptually very interesting. Part of the reason why I eventually got into thinking about money specifically was some of the issues of, of semiotics, like representation, science, and we can, you know, perhaps talk about that as the conversation goes on, but money itself is such a fascinating um, problem and conundrum and the fact that we still don't really understand it after these centuries of reflecting on it. And yeah. Nobody can really agree on it. Uh, it's crazy that it's like right here in our hands. Um, well, less and less, obviously, as we go to digital, but it's like right there and we're immersed in it and yet we don't know what on earth it is. Uh, and that, that's in itself a super fascinating thing. Um, so there's, there's that. There's you know, my, my own experience as a you know, person of color, um, multiracial, multiethnic background, sorting through that experience as well. A lot of these factors um, and, and finding religious discourse and theology are really uh, fruitful space to think about that. I guess we should say like mm -hmm. you, you've written this book. Is this your first book, The Divine Currency? It is, it is. Yeah, The Theological Power of Money in the West. And yeah, we're, I mean, we're definitely gonna talk, I mean, we're already sort of talking about it, but before, <laughs> before we jump into it in a more like robust way, I, I wanna pick up on something you just said, um, kind of the difficulty in just kind of thinking and talking about money. So how about a really deceptively simple question to get us started? Absolutely. What is money? <laughs> right. So the standard, <laughs> the, sta the standard uh, textbook answers that you'll still find in many economics textbooks re revolve around the idea that money is a, um, a medium of exchange, that it's a uh, lubricant to overcome the frictions in trade and exchange that arise in as we attempt to barter with one another. And so it's categorized as a means of payment, a method of account, a store of value, uh, and a measure of value. These are these are ways to 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 understand part of what money does, but they don't really explain uh, where it comes from or why it works the way it does. And so, finding um, being dissatisfied with these kind of orthodox explanations in economics about money, I gravitated towards economic sociology, economic anthropology and certain historians of money that look into numismatics and the rise of coinage and the origins of these categories. And um, a loose consensus understands money to be something that's correlated to sovereignty and to centralized power um, that emerges in situations of hierarchy where there are um, power differentials and perhaps a, a, a um, small center that is managing a larger center of, of bodies and resources. So money is a is a certainly a method of accounting to track those resources, but it's also instituted by sovereignty, by sovereign power, to regulate the exchanges between a particular governed body, um, governed populace, and that centralized power. Um, so some of its first evidence are these tabula tabulations, these clay tablets in um, these ancient agrarian empires, uh, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians. And then another iteration is coinage in the city states where they're asserting forms of sovereignty and forms of, of local governance and control. So, so as I say in the book, I mean, the shorthand is money is a sign of sovereignty. It's instituted by sovereign power to regulate subjects and regulate exchanges. Um, that's kind of a shorthand way to look at it. Uh, it. It's also a marker of credit and debt. And that's another aspect that we can talk about that is an important part of that. Um, but I think it's important not to lose the political location of money, that money is a political technology. It's not- um, It's not separable from that. It's not separable from that. And so we often think about it, and this is part of our own inheritance as, um, as moderns, is a rupture between the economic and the political, which is also problematic that we need to, to, to think about um, 
reuniting in certain ways. And so money helps us think about that because we tend to think of money as simply economic. It's just this kind of way for trade to happen, but it's actually deeply, deeply political. Yeah. Yeah, it seems, it seems that the, the connections there are on these notions of power, sovereignty, and the centralization of power within the political and the economic sphere. Uh, you argue in your book that um, money facilitates very easily through these systems of centralization of power. And so you have like these inscriptions on the coins of like ancient emperors or, or um, Caesars on them. And through that inscription, you know, like which realm you're like, depending upon the coins you're using, you know, which realm you're entering into. And so connecting that up to with theology, which is um, also the thrust of your book, um, you talk about the inscriptions of like, of God's character upon, upon individuals, like the Logos' character. The Logos is like this inscription of God written onto uh, the, the, I guess, the members of that realm, right? So maybe, um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about this idea of like the numismatics, like the inscriptions mm -hmm. of like the, I think that's what numismatics is like the, totally. The study of the inscriptions or like the, uh, the, sig the signatures, the signs and the semiotics of, of money within like a particular realm and how that kind of correlates with a theological realm. Like when you, when you go from like the, what we can call the secular realm of money and, and political power into the theological realm, if you can like make those connections a, a little bit. Yeah, that, that, I think it's helpful background too for the theoretical stuff we can talk about. So the first coins, the, the, the evidence we have of the kind of these, these coin hoards that have been excavated in the Medi ancient Mediterranean world Many of the oldest ones only have an image stamped on them. They don't even have demarcations of value that this is, you know, whatever sort of, um, you know, account. <clears throat> Part of what that people theorize is that that shows already that money emerges as, as you mentioned, this, you know, initially a token or sign that ties it to a certain center of power, that holding this token connects the, the holder, the user, to a minting authority, to some place that stamped the seal, which is usually a royal seal, some sort of image of an animal, uh, maybe even the face of the sovereign that links it to that particular family, dynasty, um, sovereign power. So that already shows us the implications of money and image and representation and that it's primarily tied to asserting sovereignty versus just simply demarcating um, different kind of accounting accounting systems. <clears throat> and what's interesting is is with that lens, when you look at uh, some of the, the the writings of some of the, the patristic thinkers and early so-called church fathers, is that they were they were super attuned to this in ways that we've sort of forgotten. They realized that that to issue money is totally a declaration of sovereignty. Somebody like Tertullian talks about this that it's fitting for a sovereign to basically to circulate coinage, and that one should basically question the authority of a person who doesn't have their own coins with their stamps on them. Mm -hmm. So this already becomes then a a useful resource for uh, these theologians to begin to think about how God the Father as monarch and sovereign and king might be represented in God's territory, namely creation, the world. Um, and this is why you see language about the image of the emperor, uh, how when we, when citizens prostrate themselves between the image of the emperor, before the image of the emperor, that that passes that honor on to the emperor. This is a common trope in um, you know, Athanasius and uh, Basil and other thinkers. They say that, that, that that's right. And that similarly, if we worship the son, we're worshiping the father. So they already are using that as a legitimate sort of chain of representation. Um, <clears throat> and then specifically taking a coin, looking at that image, that indicates where it comes from, what, whose authority it represents. So you can see these parallels there. And this, this of course, comes up in the, the famous gospel story of the render unto Caesar, where there seems to be some precedent set where Jesus, Jesus appears even to, val to validate that, that chain of signification. Um, you know, that's, this is the, it's a very, uh, it's a passage that's perplexed interpreters for centuries, right? And we have lots of different interpretations and many people think it's about kind of separation of church and state and paying taxes and maybe, Maybe there's something there, but um, fundamentally, you know, Christ is saying, yeah, there, there's this chain of representation that this coin has Caesar's image. And so it indicates um, from what, you know, that it's, it's economy. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, the image of God in humans indicates where they're issued from and what stamp they bear. And this is the direction that the, the, many of the fathers uh, took. Uh, so this language that you mentioned, uh, Preston, about uh, the image of God in humans and being marked with the logos is taken from is taken from a language of stamping and coin marking and imprinting. So humans are, are described as coins, basically. I mean, we function as coins because we bear the image of our of our issuing king, God. Uh, so, 
Yeah. So what are the overlaps then between like um, the realm of uh, in terms of coinage and representation and like bearing the 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 image and stamp of like whoever our sovereign is in, in the case of Christians or <laughs> other theological um, people, uh, other people of different religions like um, you, you bear the image of the person you represent. Right. So for Christians, it's the logos is Christ or it's something along those lines. Um, but within a different realm. Uh, let's say like within Caesar's realm, you bear, you're bear using the coinage of Caesar. So like I, I'm wondering about the dynamics between like the characteristics of, of bearing the image of somebody within a particular realm, um, your, your sovereign, right? So the um, the sovereign representation of the coinage and how different coins can interact with each other like within the, within the same like material realm. Does that make sense? Well, I, but, maybe I can pick up on that and like kind yeah. of focus that a little bit. What's implicit, I think there is this dual nature of money in a way, or it has it has both an imminent and a transcendent qualities, which kind of correlates to the divine and earthly sort of economies. Maybe an inroad into that is is in this idea of the incarnation, where you start drawing out these valences of divine and earthly economies and administration, and 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 this term of like oikonomia. Is it oikonomia or okonomia? I can never. I don't know. Um, oikonomia. So the emphasis is on the on that the, the final syllable. Oikonomia. Okay. Um, I thought it was a tomato tomato thing. I didn't realize it was a third third option <laughs> yeah economia um oikos the house economia economy yeah okay um yeah there's a lot there in terms of what you all have asked i mean one of the things um i, I did want to mention is this the parallelism we see with with sort of material coinage and human coinage at least in terms of the some of the patristic texts is that um postures of fealty, of subjugation, of reverence, um, sort of transfer. So the same way that paying taxes with these material coins is a display of one's um, subservience to Caesar and kind of acknowledging, yep, Caesar has the authority here. Uh, likewise, then, you know, Tertullian and other fathers that are, re that are reflecting on this passage say the same way um, humans then render themselves to God in worship and in subservience and in fealty. And so there's, there's a sort of a transfer of that economy. And so taxation or paying tithes would be then kind of this tribute of praise. Um, offering praise to God is a sense, uh, is in a sense sort of this paying taxes. So the kind of elision between tithing and taxation is also interesting as sort of one material side of that and how the, um, you know, is it, is it that the, the paying tithes in the church is simply sort of miming this earlier notion of taxation or is it the other way around where actually we have a, there's a, there's a more original notion of sort of giving tithes or honors to the gods and, and then kings sort of emerge in that site and then taxes come out of that. I mean, one could tell the story you know, either way. And that's why I think it's important to kind of uphold this dialectic between the two um, that there's this, this, this notion of, of giving um, honor and giving one's first fruits. And that can be in the material economic realm with taxes or with kind of the spiritual, the spiritual notion. Yes. Um, but the, the incarnation does bring those together. And so <clears throat> part of what I'm tr trying to draw out and what I say is sort of an implicit theology because um, it's, it's, you know, I piece together claims that are made to then make a larger claim that Christ functions as uh, the primary coin and representation of God, the father um, you know, there may be instances where we can find, you know, I haven't in, at all, in all exhausted the material where, where Christ is directly sort of described in that way as a, as a, as the coin of the father. Um, what, what I have found are humans described as coins and then Christ described or the son described as the original image that is stamped on human coins. And so when that image becomes material, it becomes basically the perfect coin uh, that regulates the realm and sort of sets the standards and sets the accounts right. And so that's one way to think about, you know, how we can think about Christ as, as the coin, is that it's, this is the originary image that is stamped on humankind uh, that then becomes materialized and is then sort of sent to regulate the economy and then leads to these things that I discuss in later chapters about ransom and, and exchange and whatnot that are also part of this whole, um, part of this whole conversation. interacting or using those coins with the image of the sovereign indicate at least tacitly, at least implicitly, that one trusts in the authority of that sovereign. Um, 
that one trusts that this person has the authority to sort of enforce these exchanges, to guarantee them, to guarantee this coinage is valuable. This is why we see that currency values plummet, often in times of war and in times where confidence is shaken in the authority of that state and the authority of that power. Um, and if a nation, a nation falls or is destroyed, theoretically their money is, is valueless. So to use and to buy and sell an exchange with coins bearing Caesar's image is to indicate at least a base level acknowledgement um, of the authority of Caesar, um, a certain kind of faith in Caesar. Um, and it's to enter into those exchange relationships where you're ultimately obligated to render a portion of that back in taxes. And so every sort of exchange has you know, a fraction of that that's rendered to Caesar, rendered to the governing authority. So that, that puts you into these circuits and these relationships. Um, and then so where it becomes interesting with ransom theory <clears throat> is that, um, you know, as you note, uh, the, the, the typical reading and the, the, when, when you read patristic theologians and, and historians reflecting on these theories, it's primarily read as humans are in some sort of debt bondage to Satan and then Christ is the redemptive payment that sets humans free. And that's part of the story, but what I'm trying to draw attention to, at least with a close reading of Gregory of Nyssa, is that that's not all uh, the story, and that, that doesn't explain the whole narrative, because if Christ were simply just the purchase fee to release humanity, then why is Satan somehow suddenly in bondage and servitude to God? Uh, if it's a normal, a so-called normal or bear market exchange, Satan should receive his payment and then be free to go and go on his way. So something is happening in this in this tale that that has not been attended to by um, people who have who have interpreted and read these these ransom theories. Um, and so that, that's why I draw attention to this logic in particularly in Gregory's theory because Gregory provides one of the most sort of thought out and detailed accounts of of ransom is that God seems to be paying back Satan the same way that, you know, give, giving Satan his due, which is not simply, you know, paying Satan with Christ, but offering another sort of counter loan or a counter, a counter you know, imposition of debt. So just as Satan imposed a certain kind of hidden deceitful debt on humankind, God then does that for the sake of redemption, setting humankind free, but also imposing a kind of entrapping debt um, on Satan. And Satan finds uh, himself in, in these kinds of loan obligations to the sovereign. Um, and that, that's not really problematic for many of the church fathers. These ideas of deceit and trickery are actually held up as, you know, like that's really good fishing. Like to, again, to use this kind of, this kind of bait and hook analogy, like God's a good angler. God has used the debate, um, effectively and hooked Satan and that's, that's glorious. And so, uh, and I do note that a lot of modern interpreters find these theories, you know, somehow repulsive, you know, the idea that somehow God could be deceptive and you know, how could this be? And these, these fathers don't seem to have problems with that, but yeah, again, they don't, uh, it's not problematic for, for God to use these bait and switch techniques and the, these debt economies provide a, a great space for that, for, for these fathers to articulate what, 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 what's happening at a cosmic level. Yeah. And so that ties this idea of economic warfare in a real direct way to, you know, soteriological formulations. Yes. Right. And then, then once that idea um, is established and circulates kind of through not just like the theological imaginary of like these patristics and that sort of thing, but the entire economy is infused with the logic. Right. So that notions of salvation is are, are tied uh, to, to money and to the market, which, you know, yeah. have to grow and have to grow infinitely. Um, yeah. We, we talked to Clayton Crockett a couple weeks ago and mm -hmm. he, he mentioned, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but this idea that the central tenet of um, the capitalist religion is that growth can be infinite. I, I think I remember there's somewhere in here you kind of get into that. Maybe you can draw out how that is sort of formulated in these early thinkers and how that works. Yeah. So certainly I wouldn't want to, to say that, I'm not making a, rat, a claim of radical origins here that this all comes from Christianity. And I think that's, you know, I, I talk about this in my introduction that that's methodologically really problematic to sort of give a theory of pure origins. Sure. Um, you know, there's evidence in the ancient world that there's plenty of awareness that economics can be used as a kind of conquest and that economics can be used to sort of trap and impose um, obligations on folks to then extract resources from them. I mean, these command economies in the ancient Near East were doing this. Debt slavery emerges as a way to extract labor power from, from subjects um, and to make incursions into new territories. And we see this with Rome and, and so-called barbarian territories as well. But what Christianity does is add, adds a layer of, of 
valorization, of sacralization, of saying, yeah, like this is what God does. And so there's implicitly something that, that, that gives it a, 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 a veneer of, of sacrality um, that I think adds, um, uh, it's pouring fuel on the fire and adding um, a lot of power and weight to that, that kind of language. And so we do see that permeate uh, Christendom and you know the Middle Ages with language of, the, of, the, of usury and loaning as being included in the arts of war that it's, this is a legitimate tactic to use against one enemy is to impose debt on them. And we see that sing- signaled in The Merchant of Venice, for instance, as, and, and in plenty of other uh, literature. <clears throat> um, and so there, there is, there, there's this connection between, between conquest and money um, and imposing uh, economic uh, relations on subjugated folk, extraction of taxes, um, this gets taken up in colonialism and there's been reflection on how in the colonial powers often will come into a territory and impose their own currency on that territory as a way to declare their sovereignty and to try to bring to discipline subjects mm. to exchange relations that, that, um, obligate them to that central power. Um, and there are, there are also various, uh, accounts by anthropologists in colonial situations where, subjugated peoples recognize that and they'll they'll only use the the currency basically to pay their taxes and otherwise they're using alternative currencies or no 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 sense of currency to do their their own exchanges because they're aware of what that means um but then this notion of growth as well and this is something that um, that dotan lesham in his book um on the um you know the kind of the origins of neoliberalism uh, that, that, that's a theme that he focuses on a lot where he highlights that this, this Christian notion of infinite growth and expansion, um, gets applied to notions of the economy as well. And so this idea of limitless growth, uh, toward a horizon, infinite horizon, the ways that that's connected with language of apotheosis and deification in the Christian tradition, um, elied with ideas of growth and return in, in economic language as well. And so that, that's, that's part of part of the source of that um, that that language, and so when there isn't a, <clears throat> a notion of a fixed closed system or a fixed sort of cycle of return, um, but the the horizon is infinite. The horizon is the eschaton. Uh, you know, what? How does one impose those kinds of limits um, on economic growth that we see in in Aristotle and other um, you know ancient thinkers mm-hmm. uh, that are reflecting on this? <clears throat> Are you talking about usury? Kind of like that, the the uh, sanctioning against usury that through, we see throughout the, the Middle Ages, and I think you also mentioned Plato and and Aristotle both in your book talk about how this idea of, of interest or usury is this is something that could it's problematic to say the least because it, it brings about this kind of um, can't remember the language you used but uh, or that you were quoting them of using but the tyranny it's a tyranny but like it's also it's something about like it's um it's like a gluttonous kind of like. Um, mm form of existence where you're it, it's a tyranny because like you're lending and then you're expecting more back right more than you yeah. lent out yeah i mean certainly we see the language in both in these greek thinkers Arist- plato and aristotle as well as in um you know jewish thought you know way preceding christianity as well that um interest is a kind of unnatural uh, fruit born from this it's kind of an unnatural child uh, there's something perverse these thinkers say the idea of interest that money can generate more of its own <clears throat> without labor without um without uh, the effort of the the the, the lender mm-hmm. and so that's part of what the language that gets taken up in the in the middle ages to sort of put constraints on usury is that there's something unnatural about it uh there's also language about time there's an awareness of the time value of money but but putting a price on that uh, many thinkers will say is somehow a, a violation of the sovereignty of God over time. That time is the providence of God. And so that we would somehow enumerate that and put value on that is also violating um, God's, God's control of time. And there's a certain conceit in that. So I think a lot of, a lot of the tensions that emerge in medieval thought that then rupture in the Reformation and, and into modernity are, are these, these impulses, these, these, these tensions that there's a sense that we need to constrain this, that, that money uh, it should be a zero sum exchange that if there's profit being made that somebody's being exploited and we see those of course taken up in, in at least certain kinds of, of um, critical theory and Marxist thought uh, with another notion of infinite growth and return and even these strange stewardship parables in scripture where God seems to favor the disciples that multiply their coins you know what what is what's going on there right um, that seem to valorize this kind of growth. Um, and so there, there's these at least two, I mean, there are multiple kinds of impulses, but these, these are intention, 
Uh, and there, you see this, you know, the, 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 the scholastics you constantly trying to erect these kinds of barriers and, to, and do this kind of casuistry to, to set constraints on how lending can occur. Uh, not to mention the perpetual, the presence of Jewish communities that are in the medieval period, in, 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 in medieval Europe that are, um, of course, persecuted, uh, hated and reviled and recognized as totally necessary. And so there's this weird tension that we see where, where, where Christian sovereigns are going to, to, to Jewish moneylenders because they recognize the need for this, these resources and yet have this cognitive dissonance because they're condemning what their, their acts the whole time as well. Right. And they were restricted in, in, some, in many cases to that sort of activity, right? So that they could be that's, that scapegoat. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So drawing a, yeah and that's an, an, a, a really interesting way that you see this, this really radical distinction that's made. And so this sort of fracture within the theoretical realm is imposed on the social realm where these communities are forced to lead these you know, almost, almost abstract existences where they're, they're not supposed to be identified with or do anything else except this one activity. And then it becomes very easy to, to, to place the, the notion of the moneylender and the usurer on the, the, the Jewish identity and elide those and collapse those so that they become synonymous. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting too because it, it gets into like the interplay of, of power, which is kind of like how we started this conversation in terms of defining money as, in terms of its power relations and as one aspect of it. Because um, if you're using the the coins of the realm, but you're also an outsider, right? Like, how does that play in with like your identification? Because you're not you're not represented by theologically, at least, um, the coinage that you're using, um, we're talking about Judaism and Christianity here in the Middle Ages, like you receive the loans from somebody and you become indebted to them as an other within a system that you're already kind of inhibited or prohibited from like truly acting and engaging in. I'm just, I'm just thinking of like, in terms of like the, we're talking about debt and debt obligations and like you become somebody who becomes bounded to a system that you're not really even necessarily freely a part of. There's like an inclusion exclusion thing there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we we certainly, we certainly see this in communities that eventually will try to assert their own identity. I mean, certainly in earlier period, um, you know, we can think of the Maccabean revolt and other other situations where Jewish communities were, were rebelling against um, Greek and Roman rule. They would you know issue their own coins, and and, we, and there's plenty of evidence of that in other other situations as well, where the issuing of one's own coins and currency is a declaration of a certain kind of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the overarching sovereign. It's a, it's a declaration of revolt and independence. Um, and also, you know, Rome tolerated this to a certain extent. The various provinces had their own currencies, although many pundits and politicians, you know, said that rail, they railed against this and said for Rome to be glorious and, and complete, you know, we need to have one single standard of currency um, and one one kind of token. And so this, this persistent provincial coinage is a problem there. Um, but, but absolutely with, with, Jewish communities in medieval Europe, there is this, this, um, you know, inside and outside existence where one is participating economically, but is perpetually placed on the outside. And there's, there's a certain kind of precarity that that, that, that reveals. That being an instance of the homeless soccer that Agama talks about in his series. So this kind of figure who is, I guess it, it might not necessarily be because the homeless soccer is a kind of figure who is excluded from the sacral realm. It's the guy who you can who you can murder with impunity, but who cannot be sacrificed to God, right? It's not it's not actually a sacred figure, but it's somebody who still operates within this kind of like political economic realm. It seems that. analogous, right? There are certainly resonances. So the homo soccer is <clears throat> is politically excluded. I mean, that's that Agamben's right. Agamben's register is the political primarily, and that part of my you know longer kind of critique that I have right. um, with, with his work. Um, is the way that he construes economy in relation to this. Um, but homo soccer is excluded from the political um, and so makes the political possible in a certain way that, that the, 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 the homo soccer has a sort of mirror position to the sovereign <clears throat> that is also outside the system. Um, and the homo soccer is sort of a limit, a limit case of being excluded from the political, but through that exclusion sort of helps define what the political right. is and renders that political. Um, I mean, yeah, that's whether or not we can describe these Jewish communities as, as homo soccer, I think is a, you know, an interesting question to explore. Um, you know, some might say that, that, that they're, they're still, they're still included in certain ways that perhaps is not as radical as say the, the camps, which becomes, you know, right. a Gaman's example. But I mean, there's a tra trajectory there from these cloistered Jewish ghettos mm -hmm. that then, that then become manifest as these death camps. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a, um, a lineage that one can draw there and the logic that gets worked out 
uh, in the history of Europe, according to Agamben's reading. Yeah. Uh, there's completely a link there. Um, I, you know, I'm interested. One of the things I'd, I'd like to, to do work on at some point are the economies of, of these camps. Um, there, you know, there's ways that economy is there and, and included, um, you know, certainly economies of death and, and, and there's kind of a, a necropolitical um, um, economy happening there. Um, but, you know, Agamben doesn't, doesn't pay attention to those kinds of exchanges. And I think that would be something that'd be interesting to explore is how do we construe uh, exchanges of value that are, that are, um, sustaining and part of this part of these these networks. We mentioned it just a moment ago. You know, you talk about how competing currencies are like they appear at these kind of key historical moments when when sovereignty is being challenged. And, and I'm wondering, what do you think about this latest wave of excitement around Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency? And I don't know, like, what does that indicate to you? Because I could I could see multiple readings going in different directions. What center of sovereignty is perhaps being challenged here it certainly is trying to challenge uh, modern state sovereignty i mean what's interesting about bitcoin <clears throat> is that it's and, and blockchain uh, technology which undergirds it is that its creators are self-consciously um they're aware that this is you know trying to remap uh the diffusion of sovereignty on the ground so whereas with modern traditional modern fiat currencies the state ultimately is the guarantor of those currencies. The idea with, with cryptocurrencies, again, based on blockchain, is that the guarantee, the, the source of guarantee, the source of sovereignty is, is diffuse among a whole network, right, of computers that sort of, sort of record these transactions. Um, so at least initially on the surface, it looks like, okay, like the center, there's no, no longer one center that's authorizing this. It's, it's sort of a bunch of servers all over the world that are recording these transactions that then authenticate them. Obviously, depending on how, you know, how far you press, you, you're then, you know, need to think about, well, what are the laws um, that are making these territories stable, that are enabling these servers and computers to exist, that are undergirding these exchanges? Um, what are the material structures that are undergirding these, these, these networks? Um, what are the political and legal structures that are undergirding these? And so it's, it's a question of whether we really have escaped nation state sovereignty and, and, and uh, the materiality that, that makes these things possible. I think that's a live question and a live debate. I, I, I remain, uh, you know, I find the, the question of cryptocurrencies and sovereignty extremely interesting. I, I remain at this point unpersuaded that it's at this, that that's a totally novel um, uh, orientation of, of sovereignty and power. I think there's ways in which without the nation state, cryptocurrencies as we currently use it are, wouldn't, wouldn't function. They're still relying on, on yeah. nation state structures and forms of international law. Um, it's also, I think, an interesting question of whether it, it actually is money or whether it's actually just an, a new kind of virtual token for barter. Um, and there, there's, you know, all, all the kind of controversies around like Silk Road and all these sort of dark parts of the dark web where people are now exchanging currencies without ways to track it, where it, it may just be, you know, a form of, you know, a token that's now valuable um, that people can exchange, but it's not really, <clears throat> you know, money in a traditional sense. Okay. Preston, a moment ago was, was talking about the relationship of, of uh, economy and, and power. And, you know, we've already talked about how the, this idea of like coins are these representations of sovereign power. They circulate through a population and consolidate um, a territory or rule or whatever. You know, in this case, we're talking about nation state. So obviously we're using coins and cash like less and less. And I wonder like what that may mean, what the implications are, maybe nothing. <laughs> of when, when, these re when our representations of the sovereign is absent in, in our transactions and in our exchanges so that the sovereign is essentially a faceless sovereign. And, and I think this is like analogous to what we were just talking about in a way. It reminds me of Nietzsche has this um, you know, pretty well-known bit where he talks about how truth is a coin that through long use has, has lost its image. Mm -hmm. and, and there's all this conversation today about how truth is under attack and all of this seems to open the door to like these reactionary movements and, and these sorts of things. And perhaps we could point to the rise of, rise of nationalism and these kinds of things. I don't know. Maybe it's a stretch. But what do you think about that idea and what the implications of that may be for our contemporary situation? Yeah, I love that passage from Nietzsche because he's, you know, he's reflecting on metaphor and how me he, you know, he says that, that truth is basically an assemblage of dead metaphors. Um, which is, I think, you know, wonderfully provocative um, and, you know, links in exactly with what I'm trying to do in, in, in my text of showing the importance of metaphor and how metaphor does make these links 
um, that then become submerged and forgotten, but still have still have um, you know value and still sort of circulate as a certain kind of coin without its image. Um, uh, you know, certainly in the 80s and 90s, a lot was made about the the end of the end of money, the 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 kind of end of cash, and it's all it was all going to be digital and what this would mean. Um, you know, as I mentioned with the cryptocurrency, you know, this still is relying on legal structures and state sovereignty in a way that I think is, you know, basically the same as cash economy. So there's something fundamentally institutionally that I think is the same. But from, you know, from, from a phenomenological perspective and from this experiential perspective, as you note, know, there, I think there may be little long term consequences of exchanging now with just digits on a screen as opposed to actually materially handling money and handling images of the sovereign. And you know, that, that, you know, long term, that may have an effect on one's awareness of, um, or lack thereof, of, of obligation to, to a sovereign center. Or perhaps that makes sovereignty more, maybe this is just a, a radicalization of you know, this Foucauldian turn to governmentality where, where power is now diffuse and dispersed and it's just you know, much more internalized and it's just it's still there operating but we are just we don't see its centers anymore and it's become radically imminent um and and we can see that with technology where we're all going to have microchips in our hands where we can scan everything um at the super supermarket where it's you know our credit card is part of our body i mean that's totally there in the next 10 15 years um so you know, we are going to become coins in that sense, perhaps, or credit cards. So they, that could be, you know, a way to think about this this, this sort of downward incarnation of sovereignty into the flesh, uh, where our bodies and, you know, our sense of, of exchange and power is all totally, totally imminent, radically imminent there as well. You know, in, in this, in my text, I was pretty intent on trying to hold a, a so-called orthodox or mainstream Christian thought to account with the, this legacy, rather than move too quickly to, you know, here's a radical transformation. But I, you know, I'm interested in kind of these, these genealogies and, and their implications for our ideas of power and, and how institutions have been shaped by them. And so I, I, I want us to kind of linger with the, the troubling legacies of, of, those, of those things. But even if we remain in the register of economics and debt, uh, you know, one could imagine the idea of God holding a debt over humankind that then gets thrown out completely, rather than rather than necessitating the payment of Christ. So why is it that early Christian thought couldn't simply declare a radical jubilee and say God as sovereign has actually instituted debt forgiveness? You know, we have the language of jubilee in scripture and God is described as a sovereign who forgives debts. And yet, and yet, hidden in there and actually well not hidden in there but worked in there is well but if we're if god's going to forgive those debts christ has to pay the price christ has to suffer so right. why is there that why is that counterpayment necessary why can't theology be constructed where god simply um forgives the debt cancels it um, breaks the tablets as as the sovereign would do so to speak um i have elsewhere critiqued debt cancellation as a, you know it's also problematic and that's a, that's a different set of problems that it raises mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what it says about sovereignty um, but you know what, that, that could be at least one sort of very obvious resource there is to think about God as the, 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 the holder of the debt who just chucks it out and says, we don't, we don't need this anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's what Jesus points to. He announces his ministry, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. He points so to that text. He's like, here's yeah. what I'm about. Yeah, exactly. So there's a declaration that's reading from Isaiah and the declaration of, of the year of Jubilee, so to speak. And you know, that, you know, and this kind of highlights the multiple competing narratives of early Christian thought in these early Jewish communities that were, were, were wrestling with the, the, this, these emerging thoughts and how perhaps the voice of orthodoxy, um, which w w was, was merged with kind of the councils and with um, political power, um, you know, s siphoned out many of those, those competing narratives to sort of one master narrative that unfortunately, at least in this case, you know, seemed to, it seemed to necessitate a kind of payment or compensation. Um, Whereas, you know, perhaps a more radical reading of, of, uh, of Jesus and, and that reading of scripture is, you know, unconditional, unconditional yeah. death forgiveness. And one thing I appreciated about this text is that you stayed away from the kind of ethical upshots to some degree. 
and just focused on the scholarship. You know, Preston and I, we, we kind of like roll in mostly leftist circles where we would just dismiss <laughs> this kind of reading today, like Eusebius or uh, Orasius um, doing these like imperial theologies. It's just laughable in a way. Um, yeah. But I think we have to kind of come to terms with it. This is the tradition that we've, you know, for better or for worse, inherited and that there are these multiple readings that are possible and multiple valences. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think part of it, has, um, you know, for folks who think that, you know, we can just sort of start with a clean slate and, and one can start theologizing and theorizing with Christian language and, and rhetoric from a clean slate and start the revolution that way. Hey, more power to you. I don't buy that, um, but more power to you. That's awesome. Yeah. My, my, my take is no, like we're, these, these, are, these are assemblages. These are master's tools that have been passed down to us. And perhaps we're still reconstructing the master's house um, as opposed to dismantling it. And that needs to be reckoned with, um, that the, this, this language is laden um, with, with certain kinds of residues of, of meaning and deployment. Um, and, you know, it, 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 we, we don't just come to it as a clean slate. And when, when folks, you know, are, are being trying to mobilizing or trying to be mobilized and they hear these different, this different language, you know, what is that activating? It's activating a whole series of practices, histories, uh, institutions that, that have shaped people, communities, uh, nations for, for centuries. And so part of, yeah, part of my claim is that there is no sort of just kind of coming, dropping in from the sky, pure, pure space to then start the revolution, so to speak. Um, that it's all, you know, these, these are all very imperfect tools that we're wrestling with and greater awareness of their histories and how they've been used, I think is, is important um, for, for more uh, honest, reflexive, self-critical uh, uses of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important because a lot of the themes we've talked about kind of center around on like identity and who we think we are in terms of where we are situating ourselves within society and history. And I think that that's really important to not forget that we're all a part of this larger kind of tradition or traditions that have shaped our, the way we think and see the world and, and kind of reframe the, the world for us. Yeah. And it links back to our earlier, I mean, our first comments about talking about my, my, my third project on ascension and, and absence, but, you know, relating to the kind of trauma, trauma theory, you know, in what ways are without accounting for those traumas, accounting for those, those, violences, wounds, um, and just sort of uses and abuses of language and thought and practice without accounting for that and being aware of that, you know, in what ways are we just reproducing that and reenacting that in new ways? And so that, that, that's, you know, there, there might be a parallel there as well with what I'm trying to do with this kind of awareness and reckoning of these histories of our pasts so that we're not, um, you know, unconsciously, uh, reproducing them. Mm. Yeah. There seems to kind of like open the door to kind of language of repression. I don't know if we, if it would be interesting to kind of, you know, put that in like strictly psychoanalytic terms, but there were moments yeah. throughout this and, and, and in your talk that I heard at AR, I was like, yeah, there's some, there's some stuff that could be done here, like in terms of, uh, you know, bringing Lacan in and, and whatnot, but I don't know if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. I haven't engaged explicitly much with psychoanalytic theory, um, for, for various reasons. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know if I, I'll go down that road, uh, yeah. that road explicitly, but absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's absolutely a kind of an uncanny return of the repressed that's happening. Um, <clears throat> or that I'm, that I'm gesturing to, uh, whether or not it needs to be exegeted in psychoanalytic, tr psychoanalytic terms is, it, you know, is another, another question or debate. And I have my, my thoughts about that, but, um, but it, there's definitely, definitely parallels. And I'm, I've definitely been influenced by, by those traditions of thought. Preston, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Or, or Devin, do you have anything else that we like left out or like, we didn't talk about Eusebius. <laughs> yeah. We didn't talk about the actual theologians, you know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's lots, there's certainly lots there and I do cover a lot of ground. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I just, I'll just mention that, you know, I think, you know, some, you know, some, some readers might be curious about why on earth I would engage with Eusebius. And I think it's interesting partly because he has been discounted for a lot of, a lot of church history or a lot of the history of theology. And partly that was, you know, a certain reading of him by, you know, we can see this in Harnack and in uh, early kind of modern, modern historians and theologians that because Eusebius seemed to be an apologist for Constantine, that he was sort of dismissed. Um, or because his theology looked a little bit subordinationist, maybe he's, he's Arian or semi-Arian, and so he was dismissed. And so uh, this minimized uh, awareness of his impact on the early church, uh, on, on theology, and on providing certain kinds of templates, you know, I, I think of thinking about uh, empire, thinking about political theology. And, and Schmidt is attuned to this. I mean, Schmidt in, in his debate with Peterson will retrieve Eusebius and say, you know, this model of Eusebius is still very, is very valid and has a long sort of shadow. So I, you know, I think Eusebius, and there's, there's recent work that I cite 
of patristic scholars and historians that are saying, yeah, we can't discount Eusebius. He's actually pretty central to the emerging early church and emerging orthodoxy. And so I think it's, you know, that, that's one reason or a set of reasons why I found it important to, to zero in on him and to go straight to that. And I think, you know, as, as you mentioned, Matt, it's a little bit simplistic for contemporary theologians to sort of write him off and say, well, yeah, he was some sort of pundit and we don't need to account for that because again, like the middle ages and even modern notions of sovereignty, there's something in his, his depictions of sovereign reign and governance that are, that seem to be lingering and seem to be there as the founding, again, a founding template, if you will for you know, political power and, and church state politics, all of that. Yeah. And, and if those ideas weren't so tragic, they'd be kind of funny. Like there was one point <laughs> there was, uh, I think it was, uh, Ar- Arosius. Mm-hmm. There was a quote in here. I can't remember what it was, but I literally laughed out loud. I was like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it was like reading like, uh, Caesar as a John the Baptist figure. I'm like, what? Right. Yeah. No, I know. You mentioned that to me before and it was, yeah, it's a roast just talking about how, you know, that one of the reasons why, um, like God shows the solidarity with humans because Christ is sort of numbered among the census as a taxpayer. Um, and this sort of shows, you know, divine identification with humanity. And so, yeah, it's sort of a, you know, a weird kind of twist there, but it's sort of making, you know, why, you know, it's basically answering the question, why was, why did Mary and, and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem under this sort of tax census? You know, what was this about? Why did why was the, the birth of the Savior timed in this way? And his response is, this is the, to show total identification with humanity because everybody is numbered in the census, everybody is taxed. Um, and so, yeah, it seems, you know, at first kind of strange, but it, you know, it kind of reflects a, a, a mentality of, of, of um, recognizing the realities of empire as totally shaping early Christian thought that, you know, this, this was taken as, um, you know, sort of foundational that yet yeah, we're, you know, death and taxes, you know, these things are, these things are like part of human, human, human reality. And so of course Christ is going to experience those things too. <clears throat> you can also read that in a liberationist perspective too, in terms of Christ's solidarity with the poor, right? Yep, absolutely. It, so. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so like just the same way that, you know, Christ's birth in sort of a humble manger among animals, among the, the livestock is sort of a sign of humility and destitution in the same way that Christ is, comes at a time when people are being, you know, this, this, this territory in this province of Judea is being taxed um, and have this, has this imposition from above uh, Christ being born then in solidarity with the poor and, and those that are groaning under taxation um, can be read as a kind of a marker of divine solidarity. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So do you have anything that you want to leave us with, Devin? Jeez. Um, <laughs> any words or, or yeah, what are you up to? Yeah. That's a good question. What are you up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm trying to figure out my thoughts on debt. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of why I leave this, this first book. I and mean, that's kind of where it ends is recognizing how debt seem, you know, debt and money will obviously work together and, and money is a marker of debt relationships, but debt seems to be a larger category. And it, you know, obviously with contemporary conversations and with work like David Graeber's and, uh, and others, uh, there's an awareness that debt is defining our relationships and existence in this kind of uh, neoliberal late capitalist age. Right. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around that a bit more, but also try to understand it's, the implications of, of the use of debt language in scripture, the ideas of God as, as using debt in these ways salvifically, um, that humans seem to be freed from debt, but then they're imposed with a new debt, which is obligation to God and, and debt of gratitude to God. Um, and what are the implications of that? Um, and then how does that link with our sort of debt, debt to sovereignty and our, our acknowledgement that um, citizenship and subjecthood in the modern West are also tied with notions of, of indebtedness um, to to a sovereign that imposes on us. And I think we can read social contract theory um, and um, notions of, of Leviathan as also imposing debt on on the governed as well. So that's that's kind of my my direction these days, and and kind of sorting out the relationships between those things: debt, political debt, economic debt, religious and sacred debt. Yeah. All right. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed this, guys. It was a really, really great conversation. I appreciate it.